We drum in that messaging around the dangers of COVID pretty diligently for a full two-week period of sustained propaganda. Early October, his former lawyer consented to Mr Murphy taking photographs. The additional photographs from Mr Murphy were not available in the NPDT, and they show a different story. In fact, going back to the pleading, all the paragraphs 9, 12, 13 involve error of fact or error of law. And I'll finish on what uh, Palmer, Justice Palmer said. At uh, Common Money 436, paragraph 4, the court has jurisdiction under the Evidence Act and its inherent jurisdiction to admit the evidence for the purpose of judicial review. If it is not, it is difficult to know how the court will assess the claim that the evidence was relevant and was an error for it not to be taken into account. Uh, we, I believe that Mr. King's evidence should be allowed in for this hearing, and Your Honour. Uh, may like to make a determination of the policy. Okay. Uh, so that's the Justice Palmer's minutes, obviously, in relation to Mr. Murphy's evidence. You're right, I don't see that Mr. King's evidence will upset um, or cause any great length to this hearing today. It, it's, it's all on the documents. And the further clarification is sought on the source of where he got the photographs to analyse. We do have that, but we can't call them to spare them. the question of whether there were further photographs taken by Mr. Murphy. Um, I think, just for your reference, ma'am, the email and the papers you were referring to is in the common find on that page 180. This was the correspondence between the um, tribunal administrator and both the parties in the exchange of the further photographs provided post hearing. Um, so this, uh, this one is after the first uh, directions, uh, formally asking the professor to file photographs. Uh, 
you're only able to test it for the better hard copy, and so then the tribunal has most likely provided those to Mr. Murphy. Mr. Murphy um, then replies by email Friday, 19 July, page 180. Please show these details that they have the vehicles on being returned by customer for here. So um, who's he sending that email to? Uh, Your Honour, he's sending that to, um, uh, apologies, the chain is unfair, but they're well, sending it to someone at the he's tribunal. He's sending it to the tri in tribunal assistant, but Lucy Ann is in it. Um, and then a further email um, to Lucy Ann, these facts were taken up to purchase. Um, then Lucy Ann, um, Ms. Kena replies on behalf of the tribunal, this, uh, the next page, 179. Uh, uh, good evening, Mr. Murphy. The only photographs on the files are the ones supplied by the Secretary Please note there will not be any text to your written email. So, Mum, that, that was the end of, of that line of thought. Mum, uh, I don't believe any further photographs were admitted by Mr. Murphy, but in Council's submission, and this was also produced before the District Court, it shows that Mr. Murphy actually had the ability to file photographs of the line at that time, he chose not to. <coughs> so, Mum, in conclusion, my, my final remarks would simply be to reiterate that Mr. Murphy's new photographs were admitted only for the purpose of determining whether Judge Harrison followed proper process and we did not make any errors yet. reservations about whether these uh, whether these new photos are admissible but what I'm going to do is I'm going to admit them um, to be the essay provisionally um, uh, for the purposes of today's hearing and I will um, rule on their admissibility uh, contemporaneously with the written judgment that I um, deliver um, on the substantive issues. Okay, so uh, then I think that brings us, Mr. Beard, on to the substantive appeal. Your Honour, it's the applicant's case that on 30th of June 2020, the decision of the first respondent, the Northern District Court, the decision of Harrison DCJ, <coughs> to uphold the 2nd April 2019 decision of the MBDT in Christopher and, and Joe and Finance, allowing the second respondent to reject the CD's business mortgage vehicle he purchased from the applicant should be set aside for the following reasons. Section 20... Now, I have actually, I should give you an indication, sorry, I should have done this before. I have read both parties' submissions, so you don't need to read them to me. You can, I'm happy for you just to speak to them and uh, explain what your, uh, what your key points are. Um, I have kept, I've actually read them both twice, so I'm uh, reasonably familiar with them. So I'm happy for you to, uh, to summarise your, uh, your key arguments. Okay. In synopsis, um, where I want to take you today, Your Honour, is... Once damage is substantiated under Section 21C of the Act, thereafter, the single judicial decision is whether or not the damage caused by the consumer was related to the vehicle state or condition at the time of supply. That's the only question available. In this case, the decision maker was materially influenced by the wrong facts and not acting as Parliament intended. And Mr. Keane's affidavit relates to those wrong facts. The decision of Hanson and corresponding orders to uphold motor vehicle disputes should be set aside for both grounds of law and fact. So, 
dealing first with the era of law. Can you uh, describe that for me in a nutshell? Oh, I'm going to get there, Your Honour. Well, can you just, before you get there, you can do it now, that would be helpful. The era of law, um, in terms of Section 20C, is a statutory interpretation argument. Uh, that goes so do you say, do you say um, I guess the key issue I'm trying to get to, do you say that, um, I understand the argument advanced um, previously was that really any damage um, precludes a right of return. Um, is that still the position, or are you saying that there can be some degree of damage, or are you saying any damage at all? Any damage at all, Your Honour, and that is the case law and hence uh, that we have provided. Right, so, so if, if that's the case, and this, this is, as I understand it, um, why um, Judge Harrison um, initially well, he rejected the new evidence because of the argument is that any damage at all precludes a right of return. There is damage showing on Mr. Prevett's photo. So, so whether it's you know minor damage, major damage, um, if the if the legal position is that any damage precludes it, um, even on Mr. Preslop's photos, it, it clearly exceeds the any damage threshold. And as I understand it, that's why Judge Harrison didn't allow the new photos in, because in fact the argument as he understood it was um, any damage um, precludes um, uh, a return. And there we have it in a nutshell. You know, she, they've, they've all done, a, all these so called learned friends have, have just danced around the head of a pin. When the fact is, there's damage. The defend, uh, Mr. Preslip admits, freely admits, that he rode up onto a concrete curb. But the, the, the part that they're missing is that the tribunal and Harrison both decided that the damage was due to ordinary wear and tear. Remember in the, in the court case in June, you've got Anna and old Georgie, like, um, Turning around, I mean Gary, turning around and saying, "Oh well, um, let's have a look at the Oxford Dictionary's, you know, definition." And Anna left out the verb definition, which is anything that causes a loss. There's no way he could sell that car for the same price on the lot, even though old Judgey and Harrison decided, "Oh, yeah, we'll try to sell that to him." Uh, I mean, he might as well try snelling. So, uh, snow to an Eskimo for Christ's sakes. Anyway, it's crazy. They're all dancing around the head of a pin. The facts are, the car's damaged. He loses his right to return. And he's just wasted hundreds of thousands of legal aid, your money, defending a private civil matter. How's that happen? See ya. ...the vehicle and it's common ground that the vehicle has been damaged. Uh, yes, Your Honour, but also he does make a distinction with minor damage and he goes into it in that pre qualification of what minor damage is. So, um, no would it be fair then to say that your argument is, is the starting point is, is as a matter of law, any damage precludes return? Yes. But, but if, if you're wrong on that, um, and that some degree of damage is permissible, that um, that the degree of damage here exceeded what was permissible, essentially. And um, that the tribunal didn't know the extent of the damage. But it still down. Um, and, and where we've taken that authority from is we've gone to, right back, we've done a little bit of an investigation into the 1992 CGA electoral bill. And um, there's some interesting comments, comments there about the purpose of the Act to protect consumers and facilitate business. Now I noticed in one of my learned friends' authorities, McBride Streetcars, uh, Justice Elias, who admitted me 22 years ago, uh, um, has said that facilitating business does not mean um, upholding, protecting consumers who conduct business foolishly or carelessly. And carelessly is the key word. Now, the, the CGA has the same purpose. Protection of consumers and facilitating business. 
Then the C.J. Hansard report goes a little bit further and talks about harmonisation of laws of Australia. And the Australian law in the this Competition of Contracts Law Act is word for word identical to our section 21C. And the Australian courts have interpreted that section once damage is established, that's it. I mean, unless the damage relates to the, the previous reasons of rejection. That's the only question for judiciary. The second leg. The whole purpose of this act was to tie New Zealand's business law with Australia's. It's said by Mr. Dunn, it's said by uh, a host of parliament politicians. about, yeah, it, it could be relevant if you were arguing about 
the extent of damage and whether this was more than fair wear and tear and whatever, but if your argument is that any damage precludes return, it's damaged. Everybody can see that it's damaged in the photos. So um, if the argument is, is, is black and white legal argument, it doesn't actually matter how, how much damage there is because it's already gone over the damage threshold. Yes, Roland, uh, where we were going was a qualification of minor, and that's where the whole extent of damage argument comes in, is the end of the um, But I, I, as I understood, that wasn't the argument in the district court that minor damage was okay, um, which was the district court cleared it up. The argument for the, um, for the today, for today's appellate, Mr. your client, was that no damage, any damage at all, um, it was an absolute black and white um, that there's no problem that any damage um, meant that you lost your right of right protection. Uh, you're all that wasn't the sole thrust in that appeal of the right. But that's still the argument here today. That's the argument here today. Uh, but I would say there's enough in the transcript no. to suggest that's not the case. From the disputes tribunal here. Gotta like David sometimes. We don't have that transcript. Gosh, aren't we lucky that someone managed to keep a record of that hearing? See ya. Um, we don't have that transcript. But is there anything there in the submissions or anything that suggests that the issues were broader than, than just just that uh, interpretation issue? Not until we get to the Minister of Justice for the in the High Court. So the, the, really the issue on the Penland District Court was this legal issue, does, does um, any damage at all preclude um, court uh, An error of fact can cause an error of law, though. Um, well, it, it, it could, but I'm just trying to see, if that was the sole issue in the District Court, does any damage preclude a right of return? Um, then when reviewing the dis judicial review of the district court decision, don't we need to focus on on, on that particular issue? Because that, that's the sole issue before the district court. Can we broaden that out then on district on, on judicial review? Uh, I, I would say uh, yes, Your Honor, of course. Um, in particular, and, I mean, and I go back to Justice Palmer and um, if we want to examine all the issues and, and close this off, then uh, error of fact was always there. Well, I mean, your client could have, could have run a two-pronged attack in this report um, because if, um, any damage at all precludes a right of return. Mm -hmm. But if I'm wrong on that and minor damage or ordinary wear and tear is permissible, then the damage in this case exceeded that threshold. I'm just not sure that is how you made this argument. Um, and also that the damage that was, or the information on the damage that the NDBT and the district court, it was wrong. And those photographs show that. I mean, because this obviously isn't, this isn't an appeal, he doesn't have another right for appeal. This is, no. a, this is a judicial review, so I have to focus very carefully on what was the issue, you know, that's before the court. Hang on, just hang on, just talk about the Waters case. Okay, now three Your Honour, in, in the Waters case, which was another section 21C case, um, the car was suffered minor damage. The vehicle was panel beaten, <coughs> and the MVDT still uh, eliminated the, lock, the right to reject. Um, and there's a number of other cases mentioned in our submissions uh, towards the end that all endorse what is consistently called the harsh approach. But the Australians have found a way, a, way, a way around that. So if I may uh, go back to the submissions, um, I'm up to about paragraph 1.1.3. Mm -hmm. So the applicant submits the 
fresh evidence substantiates that the second respondent misled and influenced both the MDT and the first respondent as to the damage hidden that's causing to the vehicle. The motor vehicle was damaged after delivery to the consumer. The applicant says the damage caused to the vehicle is significant either way, such that the right to rejection under 183A of the Act was subject to and lost under Section 21C. And that's the key. Subject to 21C. In terms of fair wear and tear, the second respondent added 2,700 kilometres to mileage of the motor vehicle. The transcribed evidence before the first respondent was that the damage was caused by abnormal use, being the collision of such great force and impact against an immovable concrete object described by Mr. Cressler as a low curve that it caused an expensive tyre to blow out and grave scratches upon expensive bag wheels and damaged the body of what is an old luxury motor vehicle, not a Dodgem. This first respondent erred in finding that the damage caused to the vehicle was consistent with all the movie actions here. And this is, again, points to Mr. King's photographs and Mr. Murphy's photographs of the bumpers and the wheels and the tail lamps. Front bumper handing off tail lamps, wheels. I believe Mr. Murphy submitted an affidavit that that down the line is 3,800 plus GST. And he was never allowed to look out at the vehicle to assess that damage before he had to do something. So, you're on with the pre-hearing interlocutor applications and the pathway of this proceeding, that paragraph 4 of submissions. I would just add a paragraph that the affidavit of Clint King clearly substantiates additional damage to the motor vehicle that was not available at the hearing in the area. Now, paragraph 7 of the submission, the applicant's evidence on judicial review. The numbers of your submissions you're reading from don't appear to be the same as mine. Is that correct? Yes, they are. Okay. So, you're saying that you're going to be reading the same numbers from both of them? Yes, this is the evidence what my client is relying on. The primary record is the NDVT transcript. That's the most telling document. But he's also... But it's a judicial review of the district court, isn't it? And the issues, no doubt, are much narrower at the district court than they are before the NDVT. So don't I have to focus a bit more on the district court? Because it's a judicial... I mean, the issues could be very wide at the NDVT, but then it's gone up on appeal on certain grounds to the district court, and the challenge is it's judicial review, so it's the challenge is the process of the district court has gone wrong somewhere. The process in... Which includes errors of law and so forth. And so I've really got to focus on what's happened in the district court. Well, the process of endorsing the NDVT judgment in itself. Well, but the whole lot didn't go up necessarily. There was quite a narrow issue that went up to the district court. So, I mean, I've really got to focus on the process of determining the issue that was before the district court found us on. Judge Harrison accepted all findings of the NDVT. Yeah, but that's in the context of the issue he had to determine. So he's not... He wasn't asked to read us all that. So, you know, as you often do on appeal, you say, okay, accept all that. This is the issue I need to determine. So we need to look at what was the issue he had to determine 
and um, has some pro has something gone wrong in the way that he approached and determined the yeah. issue. Yes, you're right. Yeah. Uh, minor damage and um, damage qualifications to section 21 C in certain words that the legislation just wasn't elastic enough to accommodate. No, we will not. Um, so, Joe, uh, relying on John Pat Murphy's affidavits, um, Mark Bell, Mark Bell, Eric King, but also his DMVDC transcripts of what was said on the day at the ferry and by whom. Um, now, you are Paragraph 6, facts arising prior to the MVD proceeding. Do we need to recover that area? No, I think I'm thinking. Paragraph 9, yeah, the <laughs> MVD could help that the applicant had failed to fix the problems with the vehicle in a reasonable time. We had all to consider whether Mr. Chris had lost the right to reject. Mr. Presswood's oral evidence to the MBDT that was he had caused no damage to the vehicle after the time of supply other than one of the vehicle units. And there, there is a, uh, an excerpt of the transcript. Thank you. 